Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Jenna Quinn, and it's my pleasure as the Assistant Director of Alumni and Affinity Engagement to welcome you all to this edition of the 49er Chat Series. Um, and so just so everyone is aware, the session is recorded. So really what that means for you is that it'll be available for you on demand on our website at www.csulb.edu slash alumni. So feel free to watch it again, share it with a friend or a colleague or anyone else that you think will get something good out of it. And with that, I am more than excited to introduce to you Frederick Griefer. Welcome, Fred. Hi, thank you so much, Jennifer, for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let me just, you know, read your bio so that way folks can learn a little bit more about you. Sounds good. Yeah. So Frederick uh, was enrolled at San Jose State University, majoring in political science with a minor in business. He also earned a master's degree in political administration from Cal State Long Beach in 2006 and was inducted into the Pi Kappa Pi uh, National Honor Society. Frederick then worked uh, in, grants, in grants management at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. He later became the Director of Grants Management and Field Operations for the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development Office of Native American Programs. Currently, Fred is working, or Fred serves as the director of the HUD Federal Housing Administration Santa Ana Home Ownership Center. And in his spare time, he volunteers with the Boy Scouts of America and mentors Cal State students. He lives in Mission Viejo, California with his lovely family. Fred, thanks so much for joining us. I love that bio. <laughs> I think that there is a lot of cool things in your in your career trajectory that I just can't wait to dig into. That's great. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. So let's just, you know what, let's just start off with some background about you. Um, can you tell me a little bit about yourself and your experiences and pretty much like what led you to coming to CSULB in the first place? Sure. Uh, so I grew up in the um, in the San Francisco Bay Area and uh, went to San Jose State. And I've always been interested in politics. Uh, I think when, when I was in high school and the presidential election uh, during the year 2000 was extremely close. Myself and a lot of friends that wouldn't normally talk about politics started talking about it quite a bit because the uh, election and the result uh, was hanging in the balance for a significantly longer time than uh, previous elections. So that really provided an opportunity for us to have more discussions and uh, become more engaged in the process. And then uh, from there, I decided to attend San Jose State University, where I majored in political science. And that really branched off in a direction where, um, and what I really liked about political science is not only was I able to learn about the philosophers of Athens and Rome, uh, but also able to participate in a uh, internship with the San Jose City Council and uh, be able to gain my first uh, exposure um, to uh, local government. And uh, after finishing uh, college at San Jose State, um, there were uh, options to go into um, an entry-level position with the city of San Jose, or to further my education and pursue a master of public administration at uh, Cal State Long Beach. And so I decided um, to uh, pursue that. And um, I definitely, it was one of the most pivotal uh, and most important decisions of my life because it put a lot of the theory that I learned as an undergrad into um, practice and uh, what really attracted me to uh, Long Beach and the Graduate Center for Public Policy and Administration was the fact that not only was it nationally ranked, but that I had the opportunity to learn um, almost as much from my classmates, who uh, many of which were mid-year, mid-career, or towards the end of their career um, in public service. Um, I learned as much from them almost as I learned from the wonderful professors that I had the privilege of um, learning under. So it was 
Uh, it's definitely um, one of those experiences for that year and a half that I was at Cal State Long Beach that I draw upon, especially as I encounter these real world, world situations in um, my career. Yeah, I love that. That is, that's such a great statement about like the program, right? And and I, I love that that was a great draw for you. Um, and then of course, I love your phrasing about the 2000 election and how it was hanging in the balance. And the whole time you were saying that I was like, hanging Chad. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a reference for all you poli sci folk. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, no, that's great. Um, and like, so you came to to the beach uh, for grad school and and as a as a grad student. Um, could you share a little bit more about your student experiences? You know, any any maybe clubs or professional organizations you were a part of, or professors or peers that you particularly had, that particularly had an impact on you? Sure. Uh, so when I was at uh, CSU Long Beach, I had the opportunity, uh, and it was actually very beneficial to me because I didn't have much experience in the public sector and in, even with nonprofits. And what was really nice is they built in a course um, for those that didn't have the requisite amount of experience that would be expected of someone entering the graduate program to pursue an internship. And so I was fortunate to have as my advisor, my graduation advisor, as well as the internship coordinator, uh, Professor uh, Frank Baber, who um, had helped put me in touch with a nonprofit that was located on campus, Associated Students Incorporated. And I had the opportunity to um, intern under the director, uh, Richard Hallett who was, a, I believe, the long-term uh, director of the Associated Students and advised the student government on, uh, you know, what they can and can't do. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, ASI is is an organization that, you know, obviously still exists today. It's still very much a part of campus. And, you know, that, that particular internship and, and being a part of campus, um, you know, did it, did it, really have an impact on your student ex experience and, and, you know, feeling a part of campus? It did. Um, I lived just off campus in apartments uh, just a couple blocks away, but it definitely allowed me the opportunity to stay around campus more. And as a lot of the graduate courses took place at beginning at four o'clock p.m., after I finished my internship in the morning, I would stay around campus um, maybe spend a little bit of time in the Golden Nugget <laughs> restaurant <laughs> uh, on campus and then uh, work to, um, you know, try to meet with, um, try to meet with, you know, some of the students that were involved in the local government, but also meet with the professors at the same time. And so it really took the commuter um, campus experience that I had at San Jose State prior to them building all the housing there. Um, and made sure that I didn't ha have the same approach and the same experience uh, as a, you know, on the Cal State Long Beach campus. So it was very uh, beneficial to me to be able to have that in it. The campus felt like a second home rather than just a, uh, a quick uh, drop in. It was more of a destination place. And I couldn't be more grateful for that um, because I, I felt like I had more of a college experience, college campus experience with my grad school than when I did with uh, my undergrad. That's so funny. It's usually the other way around, right? Definitely. <laughs> so with your with your classes and and what you learned from from your professors and your peers and your internship, you know, how how do you feel like that helped you or you know, did it really help you in getting that first job once you finished your degree? I think it was essential because um, when it came to uh, the entry level positions that I was applying for in the federal government, it was very beneficial to you know communicate that I had um, experience in not just earning a master's degree, but I had the opportunity to entail what that all involved, including the learning from uh, fellow classmates that were uh, at all levels of government and all levels of, of nonprofits as well. And I think being able to tie that to the internship that I had as well, 
helped because that gave me the first bit of work experience outside of working at Olive Garden <laughs> and working <laughs> at, um, that I would be able to use to be able to demonstrate what potential I had in sort of the foundation that I had that I felt would make me uh, well prepared for an entry level position, especially one 3000 miles away in DC. Um, so it was, it was very, very critical. You know, I was able to draw upon some of the classes that I took, organizational theory, human resource management in the public sector, intergovernmental relations, uh, public policy analysis, uh, research analysis, and being able to draw on that and uh, public budgeting and being able to draw on those core courses and electives to and tying that into um, my job and the responsibilities that uh, I was applying for it. It was wonderful to be able to have that to draw upon and without it, I definitely would have been hired for a position in the federal government or the, at least the positions that I was looking at because I would have had nothing to draw upon aside from maybe some philosophers uh, that I had learned about in undergrad and uh, maybe my serving experience at Olive Garden uh, <laughs> might have come in handy, but I highly doubt. You know, hey, serving at Olive Garden is not nothing. <laughs> it is. <laughs> yeah. So I think that for a lot of students who are interested in public service and particularly um, public service as it pertains to the federal government, um, are can, can get discouraged about the the time in which it takes to to from when you apply to these jobs to when you actually get these jobs. Um, can you talk a little bit about your experiences looking for that first job um, or that first professional job right out of school and maybe, you know, how you were able to navigate it, obviously, successfully? Uh, sure. Uh, so uh, I had decided that I wanted to do what I can could to graduate in a year and a half. So I would graduate in December and in theory, hopefully get a, a head start on uh, the job market uh, compared to other graduates that would graduate traditionally in May and June. And so that was the plan. I would uh, graduate from CSU Long Beach and then move back up to the Bay Area where I grew up and where my family still was at the time uh, to be able to apply for positions. That would be my home base where I would apply to uh, certain positions. And it took uh, over 150 applications across the three different levels of government, local, state and federal um, to eventually uh, receive um, my first job offer. But in between, I had the privilege of being able to interview at the um, city, county, state, as well as federal level um, for various positions. And it took uh, approximately three months of applying and interviewing before I received that first tentative offer. And, uh, but I admit, as I was getting close to the May and um, June timelines, uh, I was definitely getting more nervous that the competition that I had previously uh, would increase exponentially um, yeah. as I, um, as we moved into the summer. Um, yeah. So that was definitely very nerve wracking. Um, but what made me confident was that the education that I did receive from Cal State Long Beach, you know, it helped prepare me for the fact that there might be some disappointment and there might be, this might be a lengthy process. And to understand that there's a lot of, there's a lot of factors at play as a hiring manager to determine, you know, on their end, what the best fit is for that position and to not take these setbacks personally, because I don't have a full understanding of, and a full perspective of what the hiring manager is uh, considering uh, when they're determining who to put in a particular position. So I, I felt the, sit, the stars would align when they were meant to um, and that I needed to keep not get discouraged because if I got discouraged, that would definitely show in the interviews. Um, if, if you get discouraged, you get desperate. If you get desperate, um, that's something that people could see. And um, I didn't want to come across that way. And so, um, but fortunately with grad school, in the courses that we taught and the discussions that I had with professors about that, trying to get hired for that first job. Um, they helped prepare me and manage my own expectations for how grueling the search for that first job would become. For sure. 
Thank you. I, you know, I'm, I'm curious, you know, with your, with your trajectory, right? Um, was this a trajectory that, a career trajectory that you um, navigated intentionally? Or um, was this a, more of a situation where, you know, one thing led to another thing led to another thing? You know, what, what has your experience been? So I haven't grown up in a family um, where my my dad was was never in public sector. He was he did serve in the military. Um, however, having been in a household uh, where my father um, did was at risk for being laid off or was at risk for you know didn't have that job security and seeing the impact that that could have on a family and, and an individual. Uh, for me. I gravitated not just because of government and public service, but also for the stability as well. And uh, so that was something that that drew me to um, applying to federal jobs in the first place. But also um, when it came to being able to uh, not only have the job security, but also, you know, be able to help, you know, either, you know, award grant money to worthy recipients, the nonprofit, state, or federal um, sector, or to um, to help those, you know, help develop policy or help provide advice on policy in the nation's capital. It was something that I uh, I felt that th this was my, my calling at a very um, early tenure in, um, in college. After I was political science for you know, a, a couple of years and was able not just to learn the philosophy, but learn how that philosophy was implemented in public service. It definitely became, you know, apparent to me very early on that this was a tra trajectory that I wanted to go down. Um, I didn't know the specifics in terms of what would most interest me, whether it be policy or um, implementation or um, whether it would be providing outreach and engaging with people directly. Um, I I didn't know specifically what position I wanted to end up with towards the end of my career, um, which I feel I'm pretty much in the position that I I plan to be for the remainder of my federal career. I didn't know what that end game would be, but I knew that I wanted to be able to engage with people, whether it be through outreach or whether it be through policy, and I work to do what I can to assist them in meeting uh, the mission of whatever federal agency I work for. Yeah, that's awesome. I'm glad you like, you know, had a path and you just kind of walked towards it, right? <laughs> yeah, it definitely it definitely wasn't something that, uh, that I definitely had my setbacks along the way, you know, throughout my career. And I had my, my lucky breaks as well. And I think um, what really helped me out along the way was people outside of you know where I work, not I had great supervisors, but also friends and coworkers that saw something in me that I didn't, I might not have seen in me, and you know asked, hey, did you consider this or did you consider that? And I think that's what ultimately led me to the position that I'm at now. I had worked in grants, I had worked in policy, um, I was in housing and urban development, uh, working with uh, Native American uh, tribes, and uh, also working with. Um, with veterans who are homeless and at risk of being homeless, uh, partnering with the Department of Veterans Affairs. And housing was something that really took over as a passion for me because I saw firsthand being on uh, tribal reservations where there was an 80% unemployment and an 80% poverty rate um, that we could provide housing and wraparound case management services for a homeless and at risk of homeless Native American vets. And that's where I think my passion really took off in terms of determining what I wanted to do towards the end of my career. I know I'm mid-career now, but what I wanted to do for the remainder of my career um, is work on providing housing. Previously, it was with um, trying to house Native American uh, veterans and uh, others on uh, tribal lands, but now it's become home ownership. You know, as you see, and you know, we we have friends that have purchased homes and that or that are renting. They were close to being able to purchase a home, 
in 2019. And then the, uh, the market changed and it became much more competitive. And then now those that were, were close to being able to purchase a home, close to being able to have the down payment, now are struggling to pay rent. And the housing market, they feel is out of reach. So my position and my role overseeing the home ownership center is, you know, has become a passion and a cause for my life. And being able to be that last opportunity for a lot of people who don't have the down payment, who didn't have the generational wealth passed down to them, to be able to afford that home, build equity not for them, not just for them, but also generational wealth um, for future generations. Um, so that, you know, rather than paying rent, have the opportunity to build that equity and provide that nest egg uh, as well. That became a passion of my life that transcended um, public service in a, in a lot of ways, because I saw people struggling. I saw people have the regret and I saw people, you know, out of answers in terms of how they can help future generations of their family uh, succeed, especially as rents go up significantly and a mortgage more or less stays the same. For sure. Well, I mean, I'd love for you to be able to, you know, share a little bit more about your current position. I mean, you already kind of got into, cut into that, but, you know, as, as the, um, as the director of this, of the center, right. What is, what does a typical day look like for you? So um, as the director of the Santa Ana Homeowners Center, a, a little bit of context. So we have, if you look at the Department of Housing and Urban Development, we have the secretary at the top, and then you have the assistant secretary for housing. That position is also known as the Federal Housing Administration Commissioner. And under her are various offices, but the two biggest are single family housing and multifamily housing. Uh, multifamily housing involves like Section 8 housing and being able to help uh, people live in provide uh, and help provide rental assistance um, to stay in apartments and other small units. And then there's single family housing, which is um, what allows um, people to provide a very small down payment, relatively speaking, um, to be able to um, help them get into that first house. Um, so it's geared, it's a program geared towards first time home, home, owner, home buyers. And uh, so part of my job as the director of the Santa Ana Homeownership Center is we cover the outreach for and we endorse the loans and we um, provide quality assurance and investigate um, lender groups and realtor groups and um, work to be able to provide outreach to them and understand their needs and work to be able to help uh, reduce stigma uh, when it comes to the program or in bust certain myths about that. So as, as a director, not only do I oversee the operations of this 140 person office, but I also um, in the face of it and work to provide outreach to our eight state jurisdiction. Um, so there are four home ownership centers in FHA and uh, there's uh, Santa Ana, Atlanta, Philadelphia, and Denver. And between the four of us, we cover the 50 contigu contiguous states as well as territories. And specifically for Santa Ana, we cover Alaska, Oregon, Idaho, Washington, California, Hawaii, and Nevada, and Arizona. Those are our eight states. And part of my job is to not just provide uh, assistance virtual outreach, uh, but also um, in-person outreach as well. Being able to engage with various groups, nonprofits, uh, that we uh, certify for down payment assistance to provide down payment assistance, and uh, but also um, to engage with realtor groups, um, mortgage banker associations, and uh, nonprofits, and work to do what we can to expand our outreach um, and expand the program and educate those on um, the opportunities that we have, the programs that we have, whether it be the um, Federal Housing Administration, 3.5% um, down a conventional uh, loan that's for first-time homebuyers or geared towards them. But there's also reverse mortgages as well that's geared towards um, the older population 
the 62 and above that are looking to use the equity they already have in their home to pay for normal you know, living expenses and stuff like that. So it allows them to stay in their home um, and use the equity they've already accrued to pay for necessary expenses. And so um, that's a little bit of what I do. My boss is the Associate Deputy Assistant Secretary for Single Family Housing in DC. So I kind of wedge between um, the external stakeholders, the nonprofits, the lender groups and the realtor groups and other external organizations. And then I oversee the staff that's within Santa Ana Homeownership Center. But then I also um, deal with the uh, headquarters folks um, as well, including political appointees um, to make sure they have what they need um, to advocate uh, for else and help them in whatever goals that they have or envision that they have for a single family housing in, within the Federal Housing Administration. Yeah. I mean, that's certainly impressive and such such important work. Um, you know, and and I think that when folks think about what it is to have a career in in public service and is particularly in the federal government, I mean, the head scratcher kind of becomes, right? Like, I'm interested in politics, but um, you know, the tides change, right? We live in a system where we kind of volley, right, between two big Po political uh, parties here. And so from your experience, um, working in something as hot button politically as housing programs and, and policies, um, particularly when, you know, uh, those things shift depending on which parties in power at the time, like how have you found navigating that? And nav and like uh, having having you know your job successfully busting myths and that kind of thing. Um, how do you navigate those those changing tides in such a hot button topic? I think for me, I try to understand uh, a certain level of business empathy for um, the political appointees, especially that come in. You know, they they're being selected by the administration based off of their experience and also their philosophy at the same time. And I have to understand that everybody has a boss and it's important for me to help those senior leaders execute their vision. Uh, but at the same time, also, if there's things that I'm concerned about, um, that I be able to speak those objections or concerns, uh, but also have the experience and the data to back, back that up. Um, so they understand that my concerns aren't from a political standpoint, it's just potentially from an implementation standpoint, or the statistics just don't back up what they're looking for. That might have been something that was already attempted. And at the same time, you know, th this is this was the result. I laid the information out to them. At the end of the day, they make the decision. And I respect that in terms of the approach. Um, but it's very important for me to be able to communicate and be transparent in terms of all the information that I have, whether it be current information or historical information, so that they can make the most well-informed decision. And then at the end of the day, I uh, salute the flag and uh, proceed at, in, you know, our home ownership center proceeds in the way that they, um, that the political appointees and leadership in DC deem appropriate, because we're public servants. And not only do we serve the public, but we serve the presidential administration in the direction that they want to take these um, various departments, including housing and urban development. Yeah, awesome. I, I think, you know, it's definitely something for folks to wrap their head around, but also, you know, great, great perspective and great point of view for folks who are, you know, thinking about starting out in those waters. So, yeah, but it, but it does drive me to wonder, right, um, when you have, when you have such an important position and such an important um, industry, um, you know, how do you find a work-life balance or how does the whole work-life balance work for you? It's definitely a, a challenge. Um, fortunately, with working in the federal government, um, we have pretty set hours. Um, so I most likely, sometimes I have to travel and work on the weekends. Um, but at the same time, I um, am able to receive certain benefits for doing that. Um, that allow me to take time off during the week when I might not normally be able to. 
So it's nice to have that work-life balance where I'm not working 80 hours a week. And at the same time, that there are potential safeguards in place for federal employment to make sure that I'm not overworked. Um, so that allows for a work-life balance. I also have a very understanding wife and I have two wonderful kids that I think uh, keep me keep me grounded and at the same time appreciative of the, the work that that I do and just the fact that it's very important to have that balance or else I, you know it could make for difficult interactions that I have with coworkers. You need to be able to have that ability to disconnect um, from the work that you're doing. Unplug for a little bit um, when it's not rush hour. Uh, take uh, take vacation and recuperate, even if it's not a vacation, you know, take time off. And even if it involves staying home, being able to engage with those that are most important, you know, is something that um, not only does this job afford me the opportunity to do, but at the same time, um, having those mental health breaks is, is very important because without those strategically planned uh, throughout the year, then it could definitely be very challenging. That would show, and as the director of an office of 140 people, other people will see it. And they take their cues from me. And if I'm stressed and I'm frustrated and I'm overtired, they're going to see it. And um, they'll either, uh, they, I might get some sympathy, but at the same time, they might also feel like, I, that isn't for me. I don't want that position. I don't want to be in an office where, the leadership is overworked. And uh, fortunately, uh, we haven't portrayed that because it isn't true. Uh, and But I'd, I've definitely been more cognizant of the fact that my body language needs to be, needs to re reflect that the fact that I am, that I'm not overworked and that I do have that balance. And so that image is very important, not just to feel, but also to per portray out. Yeah, for sure. So, one of my favorite questions uh, of these chats, um, and it's a two-parter. So uh, I'll start with, uh, what is the most challenging part of your job? I'd say the most challenging is definitely um, trying to find the right people to fit into the right uh, positions. Mm -hmm. uh, that's And uh, also not only that in terms of hiring and recruiting, but also uh, in keeping them engaged and interested in the work that they're doing and tying the work that they do, the importance of the work they do to the um, to the mission and uh, to actual people that are benefited. And we're fortunate being in the field and not in DC where they're more, they have more opportunities to see the beneficiaries of the programs. So I try to emphasize the importance of that uh, for all the five um, division directors that work for me to impart that on their staff, but also um, for me to communicate that office-wide, um, the importance of the work we do, tying it to real people who benefited um, from, from the work that we did. Last year, we endorsed approximately 175,000 loans. That means in our eight state oh. jurisdictions, there were 175,000 houses and homeowners that were able to benefit and buy their first home because of the work that we did here. And not only will it benefit them, as I indicated, it will also benefit future generations. So trying to tie people to the mission and also trying to hire the right people for the right positions and uh, also advocate um, for positions to be posted. And those decisions are made in headquarters, a lot of the decisions uh, on who is it? There's a certain amount of positions that could be hired across the department or across a certain office. So we need to be able to justify why we need certain positions and the urgent, creating a sense of urgency for people 3,000 miles away on why we need certain positions uh, in a very tight time frame. And of course, adhering to all federal HR rules, um, but still hiring in a timely manner while we still have budget money for new positions is a challenge. Being able to weigh all that, that's hiring is in retention will always be the most difficult aspect of this job for me because you're competing against other offices that also have worthy uh, missions and goals and passionate leaders that are trying to get the same resources. So fighting over the same resources um, is definitely 
one of the parts of my job that I probably like the least, um, but it's a necessary responsibility that I have to be able to help provide uh, the directors that work for me and the management staff that work for me the necessary tools to help us execute our mission. Yeah, awesome. Well, uh, worthwhile, right? <laughs> and I said it was a two-parter. So the other part, and you kind of maybe already answered this a bit, but I'll ask it anyway. Um, what's the most rewarding part of your job? You're very kind. I, I didn't answer that. <laughs> and I, I forgot, short memory. Um, but the most rewarding part is being able to see and hear stories of people that bought their first home with an FHA mortgage and to learn their stories. And um, be, when I, I remember when I was considering applying for working in the Federal Housing Administration, reading stories of people that bought their first home years ago and that they were able to either pass that down to their children so that they didn't, you know, so they were able to get in the housing market and build equity um, or being able to stay in um, because they were able to afford put an offer on a home when homes were relatively affordable much, or much more affordable. And now that they're they're in the process of building equity. So they can look at that next phase, downsizing or handing off something to their children. Hearing those stories of people that were in um, financially challenging times that without home ownership would have struggled more um, are some of the most rewarding aspects. Because I know that not necessarily me, but the staff that worked for me were directly involved with being able to help that person get that first home through an FHA mortgage. And so that feels that feels great. And at the same time, you also hear those people that, you know, they they didn't know a lot, you know, this program existed and missed the opportunity when the the house housing market was maybe a little bit more affordable. And so those, while there is rewarding aspects, there's some where it's like, I wish that we were able to reach that person in time. Even if, if it was something that was like a decade ago before I even took this position. Um, you still have those regrets. Like if we had only reached out, if we had only educated, um, then maybe this person would be in a house rather than it, that they own and that they could potentially pass down rather than renting and struggling to pay an ever increasing rent. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, ha housing trends are, I mean, right now in the last couple of years and particularly now, um, are in fact just wild. <laughs> um, you know, what kind of impact does that have on on your industry and on your position? Um, and and what are some of the the trends that you have been seeing and trends that maybe you're expecting to see? So as uh, the housing market gets more competitive and prices get more expensive, that makes it a challenge for our program in a lot of ways because there are certain um, uh, loan limits uh, depending on the county that you live in. Um, so that could make it challenging where in certain counties, especially counties where there are large cities or urban populations, um, we might, a lot of people might not have the Federal Housing Administration as an option um, or FHA programs. Um, they might not be able to tap into those. And so they end up moving to more rural locations where the Federal Housing Administration might have more of a, a foothold because it's more affordable. Um, and um, so that involves people moving and we do have, we would have to shift our strategies a little bit to um, help assist in providing um, outreach to those areas. We uh, target specific counties. Um, what we do is we have data, internal data, but also publicly available home mortgagee disclosure act data that provides us information in terms of what percent, what piece of the forward mortgage pie that we have for FHA in a given county. And then what I like to do is be able to target those specific counties and build relationships with the local leaders and uh, whether it be nonprofits or housing organizations and work to provide them with the tools they need to succeed, whether that's through a combination of in-person or virtual outreach, a meeting with groups individually. Um, that's something that I feel is a responsibility that we have to be able to provide those people that are local on the ground, that know people personally, that are looking to purchase homes, 
um, you know, providing them with the tools because they might, you know, listen to me, but also it might be more effective if they listen to someone that we've educated and provided um, materials to um, at the local level that might be a neighbor or uh, a supervisor or, you know, that's, that's very important uh, for us. So I think with the challenging climate, it, it might press us out of certain counties in terms of FHA being an option, but those people need to live somewhere. And at the same time, a lot of them would move to more rural locations. So we could still um, help assist them. Our numbers might not be as high during a competitive housing market. And there are some stigmas that we're trying to, and some myths that we're trying to bust, but it's definitely something that we uh, would uh, try to do. Um, but at the same time, the stigmas are a big part of these. They might feel like, hey, there's more paperwork and it, there's this, uh, false myth that FHA homeowners aren't um, aren't able to uh, you know afford or make uh, make payments but the thing is is that the federal government if they default on their payments we're able to you know assure insure their loan and provide make the banks home, the lenders home. a lot of people don't know the details on that um, but also they there's education about the program that a lot of people don't know about. Like for example, we have interest rates of like six, seven percent. Let's say there's an FHA buyer or an FHA um, seller, homeowner that wants to sell their home. If they sell to another FHA buyer, that FHA buyer uh, would be able to assume the loan that um, you know purchasing from an uh, from an FHA seller. So let's say when they purchased that home, that the first seller, um, it was a 3% interest rate. Then the person buying from FHA to FHA would be able to assume the um, the, the rate, uh, the interest rate. And so that's a really good benefit, especially when you see um, it's you know 7%, I think, interest rates. That would save them a considerable amount of money. But at the same time, it's incumbent upon us to not just destigmatize the program, but also to be able to share that information that a lot of people don't know, um, but that um, we've had an effect for quite some time. Wow! Yeah, no, that's incredible. Um, I I can't I can't say that I knew about that. So <laughs> no, that's incredible, and I I think I would uh, suggest that everyone go check it out. Right. <laughs> well, so. Believe it or not, uh, we are just breezing past this uh, industry chat. Uh, these always go so quickly for me. Um, but I, I, I want to I want to end on um, a question that I always like to ask folks, um, which is, you know, if you had either uh, a, a time machine or a magic wand or what have you, uh, and you could go back to yourself when you were about to graduate from Cal State Long Beach. Um, you know, what what piece of advice would you give yourself? It's a good question. Um, probably the advice that I would give myself would be to get more involved with local um, community organizations. Um, that, whether it be, you know, United Way, whether it be the Long Beach, you know, housing office, or others within um, the general vicinity of, of Long Beach, I would definitely have, I would have told my younger self to get involved in more of those local government organizations. Not only would it maybe, that experience would have maybe helped me get a job a little bit sooner, but also at the same time, it would have, um, it would have given me exposure to the local community, engaging with beneficiaries of whatever programs that I was working on in that type of experience, I think would have been sorely needed um, when I moved to DC and was engaging with leaders at headquarters and political appointees on the benefits of various um, public services. And so that would um, probably be something that I would have done just to gain that experience, not so much for being able to apply for positions, these things worked out nicely, um, but to be able to speak from a degree of more experience um, in dealing with individuals and the needs that they have, and then working and trying to translate that to my job. 
um, and being able to um, serve the public. Well, Fred, thank you so much for all of your wonderful, you know, advice, insight, career trajectory storytelling. Um, I think that this has been just incredibly um, insightful and informative for folks who are interested in, in pursuing this type of career. So thank you so much for that. Um, for, for yeah, and for so for everyone that has tuned in today, um, I want to thank you all so much for lending us your ear and and, and your attention. Um, and uh, I again want to remind you that uh, this will be available uh, on demand on our website at www.csu.edu/alumni. Uh, um, and then I also want to encourage you all to to follow us on all of the social media channels. Uh, so that way you don't uh, miss a single uh, industry chat and that you can uh, keep involved in what we're doing um, and, and feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions. Um, but Fred, for, for folks who might want to maybe continue this conversation or, or get in touch with you to ask some more questions, um, how might people best be able to get in touch with you? Sure. Uh, so for me, um, in addition to being a first generation uh, mentor uh, in CSU Long Beach for two uh, wonderful um, students, um, I definitely can be reached uh, through um, LinkedIn. And the link to my direct profile is linkedin.com forward slash in forward slash griefer, my last name, uh, G-R-I-E-F as in Frank E-R. Don't hesitate to reach out to me. I'll try to respond in a timely manner, but um, I benefited from mentors that I could, and just individuals that I could reach out to on a regular basis throughout my college and grad school uh, career. So I want to do what I can to pay it forward. And so if you want to reach out, you want to connect, you want to send me a, a message uh, through LinkedIn, that's the best way. And I will do my best to respond. And please, I'm just grateful for the opportunity to give back just a little bit um, to uh, CSU Long Beach, which, which has given me so much. Awesome. Well, Fred, thank you so much again. Uh, it's been truly a pleasure. And uh, for all of you, we'll catch you next time. Thanks so much. Thank you, Jenin. Thank you for everyone watching.